go on and delete that one. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, Tom Matuska here with Brett Wingfield for Thursday Afternoon Live with the Matuska Tax Room Supply Company. And it's been a while since we've been with you, I think, before the holidays. Yes. And uh, time just gets away from us. We get busy with, um, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and customer work. And Everything. then all of a sudden, tax terms seem to be real busy during that time of the year. And we're caping deer heads and, and uh, skinning animals and doing daily jobs that tax terms do. Um, the last time we were here, I think we did um, casting and making reference casts yeah. of, yeah. I think we did a largemouth bass head, um, showed you how to do that, which is really important for taxidermists to have, we call them study casts, some mm -hmm. people call them death masks, and that they can refer to and kind of um, look at angles and look at sizes and look at shapes. Um, so those are really important. So be sure to check back uh, in our Facebook archives or in YouTube, and you can probably uh, um, just do a search on whatever subject you want to look because we've covered them all. Like you mentioned, we've <laughs> done just about everything, yeah. and uh, we think that we can improve on some of the earlier ones. We did uh, many that we were a little green at this whole thing. <laughs> And uh, we've improved our equipment, we've improved our techniques, and so some of these we'll be remaking, so we'll probably delete the older versions. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to feature tanning. And as we um, uh, talk to people on the phone, like every day people call in with questions. Oh. And somebody will grab us and say, there's a fellow on the phone and he wants to know about you know, one subject or another. And probably the reason we chose tanning is probably one of the most common questions that we field is questions about tanning. And it's not uncommon to get a question where somebody says, um, yeah, things are a little slow at work or I got laid off at work and I think I want to start a tannery. What do I need? I need everything to start a tannery. And my number one comment to those people is, you're going to need 10 to 15 years experience. Um, we learned tanning the hard way, trial and error, coming up you know, through the ranks. Yeah. Uh, we did everything wrong. Um, we lost furs because we didn't know, you know, lack of knowledge. We didn't know what we were doing. And through all that experience and better techniques and better people teaching, um, I think we can show you a, a real safe and um, reliable way to tan your hide. And it doesn't matter um, whether it's a raccoon or it's a fox or a coyote or a deer or an elk. There are some things that are easier for a taxidermist to tan um, in their own shops, and there are some things that are just um, too big. We had a, a person in the shop the other day, I think you remember the conversation, and he's tanning his own buffalo. And I said, a buffalo cape, just a shoulder mount, is going to weigh 150 pounds wet. He said, this isn't a shoulder mount. This is a life-size buffalo. And he's tanning it himself. I couldn't get a life-size buffalo out of the pickle to get it onto the flushing <laughs> machine. So I'm not yeah. quite sure how that's going to go for him. But um, tan, um, practice tanning if, if you want to get into tanning and you like what we show you, get something that's expendable, like a deer cape that's an extra, um, because there is a learning curve to tanning. We always talk about learning curves. You can't just tan perfectly the first time. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But we want to have a little practice, develop your technique, get all your, your chemicals and your tools. And uh, tanning is, you can do excellent, excellent jobs. People always say, can I tan as good as the tannery can? Um, we feel for certain items, we can tan better than the tannery can. Um, we have more care over, um, more control over the care of our product. Absolutely. We yeah. um, cut, think we can cut less holes because we're experienced. Um, we think we can pay closer attention. We're not putting, you know, 150 fox into, you know, a pickle. Yeah. So we think we can tan things very, very well and get excellent results. So follow along with us. Um, and this will probably be, I wouldn't doubt it'll be a three or four I bet. session I bet it will. segment um, on tanning. And we're going to um, go through a deer cape, just as if, if you, uh, you know, 
got a deer and everything from turning the ears and splitting the lips and things like that. Now, if you look at all of our um, past archives, we must have three or four on how to cape, am I yes. right? Yes. And so we're not gonna show you how to cape a deer because you, most of you will know how to do that um, or you can look back in our archives to see several of our videos on how to cape a deer. Um, but before, I probably should talk about, there are a few things before you do remove the cape. If you wanna give yeah. them a little idea of a couple things that are important. Yeah, um, one of the more important things that we do is we need to put back what we took out. I think several people have said that now. That's a lot more eloquent way. Jim, Jim Kimball's term. <laughs> is it? Um, and, but the best way to do that is to know exactly what it was that we took out and um, a good set of measurements from the deer that you have laying on the table is the, is the best reference that they can have. So um, we've got a couple charts that were put together by Gary Zayner. Um, and Kate, you might be able to show them. I'll hold it up. Um, you can see there, just in a shoulder mount, there are, oh gosh, I'll bet two dozen measurements bet that is, he's yeah. got that he's got noted here. Um, anything that you can take a positive reference and refer back to your mannequin will be beneficial. So oftentimes, and probably the most common one that we take is the front corner of the eye to the end of the nose. And that's gonna range with our white tailed deer from here anywhere from on the small side, seven and a quarter to mm -hmm. eight, maybe even more than eight. Um, on some of these really big mature deer, but that's that's going to be very regional to you. But the difference in our the difference here in a seven and a quarter inch face and an eight inch face could be as many as three or four years of maturity um, in the so, deer yeah. that we have. And so that's going to be very very critical to make sure, even though it's it could be uh, only a quarter of an inch difference, um, that could really change the mature look of the of the product that you produce to your customer. Um, so we've got the front corner of the eye to the end of the nose, very important. Um, another handy measurement that you can take is the width between the front corners of the eyes. I think we call that in an E measurement. E, I think ours is E, yep. Um, so A, if in our chart is the front corner of the eye to the end of the nose, E is the width, just speaking specifically to the head. Um, and then you can also take the um, right at, right below the ears. I think that's our B. That's our B. And then another three inches down from that would be our C measurement, two to three, two to mm -hmm. three inches over the atlas um, would be a C measurement. Now, because we don't have the carcass in front of us, those would be taken off of the cape rather than off of the bone um, or after off of the real carcass. But those are just a few, and you can see that any place that you can get a positive measurement, Gary's pretty much got an illustration here, um, the width of the nostril wings, the outside, um, the outside of the eye orbits, the width of the muzzle, um, the depth of the, of the chest right in front of the brisket, um, several different measurements if you want to take them. They're all illustrated here. The more information you have, the better chance you have of putting back what you took out. Um, that's really important, especially some of you uh, people who are a little bit new to taxidermy. If you go to the catalogs, um, they, they offer you three measurements from their mannequin. It's a, a nose to the front corner of the eye, yeah. right behind the ears, and three inches down. Um, sometime, I know when I was not very experienced, I'd mount a deer, and, and when I started out, we didn't have a huge selection of mannequins. Um, I would choose a mannequin, a deer's a deer, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he just looks skinny in the face. And there are regional differences that these sculptors sculpt their deer from. Um, you get a Texas, um, you know, hill country whitetail is way different mm -hmm. than our whitetail, which is way different than, you know, a Pennsylvania whitetail. Sure. And they, they do change from differences. We didn't have uh, the, the catalog's not going to tell you this is for only this species because or subspecies because they want you to buy their form. But, but by having measurements like this on your chart and this on your chart, um, you'll get the form and your nose to eye measured up and your neck measured up and the cape 
fits, but it's yeah. real sloppy in the face. And all you have to do is compare the measurements that you took um, to um, the mannequin that you have, and all of a sudden, wow, we got a quarter inch of Mm -hmm. sloppy skin that we got to use up and then it's going to take clay or it's going to take alterations yep. so that is invaluable and I think we have those books in mammals excellent book in yeah. mammals yeah um, and we That's actually it. as much as we've done this we've been in the taxidermy business we've done in the taxidermy business we've been in the taxidermy business for ever I don't want to say <laughs> f 50 years but it's bordering on 50 years um, cool we still take a measurement sheet like that for every yes, single every beer single that beer. comes in the shop. Yep, yep, and we use it. And we don't just take it, we use them. Um, and every, because every deer is individual. So. I always tell people, people say what's the hardest thing to mount? And I'll say the hardest thing to mount is something you know the least about. And the more you know from measurements and casts, um, the more yeah. you can make that look you know, like the animal that you're trying to, that the customer brought in. So that's really important. Life-size and game heads. Life-size and game heads. And how many pages? Must be. Oh, man. 100 pages? 100 pages. Um, and this would, although the illustration looks, you know, very much like a deer, um, this would work for a sheep, an sure. antelope, an elk, any of the game heads that you have in the shop. Um, you could still take the same notes. Um, you might just note up here, I think they're asking species, and you could put those right And I think there, the so. mammal is wolf or fox. Fox. I think a it's fox. a fox yep. um, diagram, and you can use it for a raccoon, you can use it for a possum, you can use it for a wolf. It's just yep. it's still got the same joints and everything like that. Um, so okay. measurements are important. Super important. Um, and what next? Well, <laughs> don't start without a sharp knife. Um, mm -hmm. This is probably something that many people struggle with, and we have an excellent sharpening video if you look back in our um, archives. Um, but if this is not sharp, the tool that you're using, and you're not able to sharpen it, make sure that you use something with disposable blades like a scalpel will work. Mm -hmm. um, these do not hold their edge quite as long as a knife, but uh, some people that can't sharpen a knife, you have to have something razor sharp. Yeah. Something with disposable blades like this will work good. Um, sharpening a knife, there's lots of little gimmicks, lots of little gimmicks on the market like uh, these little guys. Um, I don't even want to put my knife, I'll put the back of my knife <laughs> through here. But you drag your knife through here and all of a sudden you can cut a tomato, you know. A um, ginsu knife. We need, yeah, you can cut tin cans like those <laughs> little Japanese knife. We're going to bend in that. Um, but uh, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these little things. We even have some um, that say Matuska Taxidermy um, Supply Company on them that work excellent. They're great to take on the field, put them on your keychain. Um, they're not what I would want to sharpen my knife for precision taxidermy work. So yep. you're gonna wanna learn how to sharpen a knife. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on it because we have other programs devoted totally to sharpen a knife, but I'll give you an idea. If I need a sharp knife, I have, this is a Norton multi-stone, and it's an oil stone. It has a fine stone. It has a medium stone, that's oil. And the oil sits in a little reservoir down here. And, I use, and it's got a coarse. I normally don't use the coarse until my knife is so bad I can hardly, um, use it at all, I won't sharpen up anymore. But your knife should be sharpened at about 20 degrees. I'm gonna hold this perfectly flat. If I tipped it up straight, I'm at 90 degrees. If I did half of that, I'm at 45. So guesstimate 45, and then I'm gonna go half of that, which should be about 20 degrees. And it's a guess. And the, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. I'm going to slide my knife along. I'm going to just do the medium and the fine. I'm going to slide my knife as if I'm scraping this oil off of it. Different people have different techniques. Some people will do a little circular motion. Do the same to one side as you do to the other side. Some people will go back and forth. Everybody has their own technique. 
Mine is typically, I'm just slicing it like this. I'll go a couple directions, a couple swipes like that, a couple swipes like this. Just do equal on each side, otherwise your bevel will be off. And I'll probably do, depending how my knife feels and if I feel it really needs a lot of attention, I might do 15, 20 times. I'm gonna turn it to the fine, same thing. Another 15 to 20 times. And you should be able to feel if your knife is getting sharp or not. It'll feel sharp to you. Um, then I'm gonna take on a steel, I'm gonna hold that same 20 degrees and I'm gonna slide my knife down the steel real softly. And that should straighten up your edge and you should have a sharp knife. Um, it does take practice. You're going to do it many times. All of a sudden, you'll get it sharp, and you'll go, wow, I wish I'd have learned that a long time ago. Yes. And the next time you use it, you get no results. because, And it's going to be you, haven't, you don't have the muscle memory, I think, to hold your knife mm -hmm. straight. Um, I sometimes will take my knife and lay it on my thumbnail and drag it real soft. And if it's smooth and doesn't hang up, um, I know that I don't have any nicks in my blade works pretty good and you won't cut through your thumbnail. Um, the steel is very important. This is something that I do um, maybe every day, maybe a couple times a day. This is something I, this is something I do every three to five minutes. So as, as I'm working on a deer cape, um, my steel is always here. I'm switching my deer cape around, getting to another new spot. I will just touch up my knife because you have a very, very fragile edge ribbon of steel on that knife that will get dented on a tooth or an antler burr or dropping it on the floor or hitting the table. Um, this will straighten it up without going back to the stone. If you go back to the stone every time, your knife is going to dwindle in size down to half of this much by the end of the week. Um, you don't need the stone, you shouldn't need the stone every few minutes, but you do want to straighten up your edge every few minutes. So that's very important. At some point, you do need to learn how to sharpen a knife. And I think I was in the taxidermy business for probably three years before I learned how to sharpen a knife. And I even worked in a uh, meat cutting facility, and it still took me a long time before. I sure. could sharpen a knife. And once, once you have the muscle memory for um, holding the, approaching the blade to the stone properly, this is automatic and you'll be able to sharpen it every time. Doesn't matter how you do it. If you want to get a, a rotary one, um, mm -hmm. an electric one, we have somewhere around here, we have the paper wheels yep. um, that puts a little grit on it and it, it spins, it's a little motor. That will sharpen a knife good. But come up with some method that gives you a razor sharp knife. I want my knives, I want these knives as sharp as the scalpels. Yeah. So that's important. That's probably um, your taxidermy work, once you can sharpen a knife, will improve drastically. Drastically, drastically. And, and that goes, the same goes for any cutting tool. We want all of our tools to be sharp and it just makes us more efficient. It causes less stress to the hide or if you're cutting wood in the shop or bandsaw blade, we that from time to time gets dull and it's like night and day when you, you change struggle. the blade. Yeah. Struggle, struggle. Yep. I'm the struggle bus. <laughs> okay. Um, what about you just wipe down your work surface? Oh, what about work surfaces? Something else. Um, the most important thing in care for a cape is you don't want it to deteriorate. When a cape deteriorates, you get hair slippage. Hair slippage is caused, hair slippage is when the hair pulls out profusely. Mm -hmm. And when we were teaching the taxidermy school, the first day students have no idea what hair slippage is. And we explain it to them, it's because bacteria grows in your hair and decomposes your epidermis and the hair calls on it. Yep, I got a little spot too, or I got a little <laughs> hair slippage. And uh, so, 
that's kind of caused by excessive heat, which doesn't have to be hot. It just has to be, um, you know, freezing will stop it. And also moisture. And moisture can be from the fluid in the hide. Um, it can be from rain. It can be from somebody washed down a hide, but just the moisture in the hide itself. So bacteria takes two things to grow. It takes a little bit of heat, not very much, and it takes moisture. So another thing, and that causes bacteria to grow. Something that can really help bacteria to stop bacteria from growing is this is our bottle of bactericide, and it doesn't matter what kind of bactericide you use. Um, we want one that's compatible with our pickles because we're going to okay. tan and it's going to go into a pickle. Um, we use X Effect. Um, this is a very concentrated bactericide, hospital disinfectant. It takes one quarter of an ounce per gallon of water. So I, it's not something that I measure out. I just open this, fill it up with hot water, and I put in just a little squish. Um, I put it in a bottle like this. We usually write bactericide on here, and it's hanging over on one of our shelves, and we have sometimes two or three of these around. And anytime we're getting ready to work, we're just going to squirt the table down and wipe it off. And anytime we clean up, we go to dinner or, or get out a new cape, we'll just wipe down um, the table with X effect and it's sanitized. Um, you, uh, we see all the time people working in their shops and their tables look disgusting. Um, you know, working on a fresh hide off of an animal sometimes isn't the prettiest thing in the world, but you can make it a whole lot worse by having a mess on your table. Yeah. So anyway, always have some bactericide around. We wash our tools with it, wash our hands with it. We keep you know, yeah. things a little bit sanitized, which will really help bacteria from growing on your hide. Yep, it will save. Once you've experienced slippage, you'll do anything you can to stay yeah. away from it. it and this it's is a really career good. ruiner. Yeah, um, I always, called this liquid insurance. Yep. Um, we put it on our tables, we wash our tools with it, we wash the floor with it. Um, we put it in our pickles. Our pickles, I would never make a pickle to put a hide in for the tanning process without a bactericide yep. in it. So get in the habit of that. Um, clean work surface, we got sharp tools. Are we ready to go? We're ready. We'll show them something? Yeah. Um, do you want to show them a done one or do you want to show them a, the one we're going to work on? Let's show them a done one first. So we'll show them what our goal is. Um, we've got two, which is kind of nice, like a cooking show. Um, so we'll put the real pretty one in front of them so they can see it all done. Um, but these are just customer capes that we froze um, this past fall, and knowing that we were gonna delve into tanning at some point. So we had a few extras set aside. And this hide has just been prepped. And before we we tan a hide, we need to prepare it for any sort of tanning process, whether it goes to the tannery or it goes through our own professional process here. And that's, that's the state that this is in. We're going, to, we're going to get this hide all prepared for salt. The next step will be to salt and, and uh, dry this hide, and we'll talk to you about that in a little bit. But this one is off of the deer, the ears are turned, the lips are split. Um, everything is pretty much ready. So he's been cut all the way down the back. Um, and and why, was, why do you say that? Why would you and why wouldn't you? Would I or wouldn't I cut it? Cut it down the back. Um, we like to tube a lot of our deer. Our, mm -hmm. our deer, um, our customer deer often come in that have been taken off of the animal. Um, and we get the choice of making the incision all the way down or, or cutting a short incision. Um, we like to have the short incision. They just seem to go together nice. It, it cuts down a lot of your, um, a lot of your sewing, sewing time up. and uh, it, it goes well. We don't have, in fact, I think we've gotten such into the habit. Um, sometimes we'll pre-sew if this is our, if, if our capes come to us that are already cut, We'll even pre-sew them before we put them and on. And it works we really do. well. It, it's like a short it does. cut deer. Um, it makes the sewing time. I remember a long time ago, 
um, we had a lot long cut deer when I started in taxidermy school and the, the worst thing about mounting a deer was sewing it up, which seems all of the taxidermists out there are laughing time. at me, but it's, it, it, there's a lot to it, um, a lot of time and there can be some frustration and so forth. So minimizing that is helpful. And, uh, um, whether you cut it all the way down or, or, um, shortcut it, which would be an incision, just, just, uh, say down six inches, mm -hmm. four to six inches. Um, either way, the hide needs to be completely cleaned. And that's, um, one of the advantages of opening the hide up like this one is, is we can lay it wide open and you can see we've got all of the flesh and material move, removed from it. So Another thing we didn't mention, I see a couple bullet holes here. Yep. Um, check your hides over real, real carefully as you're caping them. When the customer brings them in, we will take the deer head and we'll actually look at it and even sometimes take a brush and, and check any areas that catch your eye. If the hair is misarranged, why is it misarranged? Was it just laying that way or is there missing hair yeah. or... Um, maybe they drug it and wore the hair off or a bullet hole or an arrow hole. And some of those can cause you great missing hours of sleep trying to figure yeah. out how to fix some of this stuff down the road. So um, check them over, check them over real careful while the customer's there because that way you can say, okay, now you have a, uh, a bullet hole right here. Yeah. And looking in here, I see cut hair. There's cut hair here but the roots of that cut hair is way up here. So to get rid of that tiny little bullet hole, the size smaller than a dime, we're gonna have to take out probably yeah. a three to four inch piece to hide that, um, which is going to make that deer a good inch smaller in that spot. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people will bring in deer and um, two shotgun slugs through the neck <laughs> in and out, and all of a sudden their, their biggest neck deer they've ever shot in their life is going to be have a neck like that if they want to go with that cape. So check that stuff over before you, um, you know, tell the customer it's going to be a perfect mount yeah. and make sure you bring that kind of stuff to his attention. Um, that's, that's a really good point because customers often don't see that. Um, they don't notice those things just as this cape laid on the table. It didn't look like there was much damage there, but when you spread that hair yeah. apart, you could really see that there was some significant damage. Um, so we've showed them the cape. Um, we've also turned the ears. You guys probably noticed that the ears are now turned inside out, um, all the way out to the edge of the cartilage. So we've done that. Um, we've also had to deal with the lip line um, we've turned that completely all the way around here. You can see those no longer lay against the side and the septum is removed from the nose. So um, there's a lot of little stuff to get to this point, um, but this is kind of what we're shooting for in order to do our salt work. A mount so. like you see behind us um, doesn't just happen. It starts from, well, hopefully before the customer brings it to you, but the minute it comes in your door, um, these take special, special, special care. And we really um, put a lot of effort into making sure that the hair stays in, that the hair doesn't get damaged while we're working on it, that the hair doesn't fall out, um, that we turn the ears to the edge, that you know, all different little details are gonna make your deer you know, look like one of these. Yeah. And it takes yeah. practice. It does. It does. So, so we get this one out. Um, yep. Now this is one that um, also came from the customer. This is the whole hide. Um, this one's been cut off. We didn't mention that, but this one's been cut off short for the shoulder cape. This is the entire cape. Um, we're going to show you how we would cut it off. And half of this one is prepped and half of it is not just in the interest of time. So we'll show you how we're going to deal with all of those things. Now here's, Anytime I have a animal in the shop, take it out of the bag, and the first thing that catches my eye is hair. A little bit of hair. And how come that hair is there? It sounds like a poem. <laughs> um, but that hair is there for some reason. Now it could be there um, from a gunshot wound. It could be there from um, gutting them, or yeah. it could be slippage, which you don't want to have happen. So. I do this for customers too while the customer is still here. I'll take my fingers, don't yank the hair because you can rip it, and I'll just pull it lightly. I'm not getting 
any hair. If I got one or two hairs out of here, I wouldn't worry. If I get a whole handful of hair, I would start to wonder if this cape is any good. So make sure that at some point, like I said, we always do it while the customer's here, I will, I'm just putting some pressure on it as I'm pulling. Hair's not coming out. I think this deer is in good shape, and I'm not concerned about the little bits of hair that's there. Um, this one, too, um, has some pretty major um, damage in the neck. That's a sizable hole, and there's probably one over here, another sizable hole. <laughs> yep. And uh, now here's what, here's what you're going to have. You're going to have an ear like this when it comes off the animal, and we need it to be turned inside out like that. The uh, lips are butter, I, I call it butterflied open. They were folded over like this. Now, the reason we, we call it splitting the lips, the reason we split the lips, we're gonna take a knife and cut through the backside so this butterfly's open, is to thin this area so that the salt will penetrate. The salt, remember, are two components that cause bacteria growth are moisture and temperature. So moisture can be alleviated by salting. Salt okay. will take moisture out of this hide and get it away from the skin and completely take away one of your components for slippage. So salt is your friend, but it takes salt too long to penetrate that thick of tissue. By splitting it open, which you need tucking skin, by splitting it open, your salt can penetrate that immediately. Same with the nose. We're going to split the nose. Um, I used to, when I would get hides back from the tannery, I would get my, my deer ready to mount, and all of a sudden I would see a little slip spot about the size of your thumb on each side of his muzzle and all of them and I was taught to blame the tannery. Galdarn Tannery <laughs> wrecked my deer again. Um, it wasn't the tannery, it was me not knowing what I was doing and this cartilage, see these, the, all this cartilage in the nose, this cartilage is actually his nasal cartilage and it lays really tight up here on the top of the muzzle. You have to lift that off with a knife, like this one. This one is lifted off. We'll show you how to do it in a minute. That way salt can get underneath there because salt can't penetrate cartilage. Cartilage is too dense. The salt can't go through. It can't draw moisture out of it. So you want to lift that up so salt can get under there. But that's right up on the top of the muzzle. When you're tanning things, um, when things start to go wrong, you start learning a lot about whether your technique is good or bad. Um, should I show them a lip yeah. here? Yeah. Okay, now this has already been, been split this far. Now you don't have to clean all of this up. That's going to come later. Um, to get them to the state that, where'd your other one go? To get them to that state, um, the clock is ticking, I guess I'd call uh -huh. it. You want to get to that point in a hurry so you can salt them. Um, the longer you dally prepping this deer cape, the longer bacteria has to grow. Um, this is now um, something that is deteriorating as you're working on him. Yeah. Um, you, can, you, you can help with bacteria side, and there's um, different things, hide lock, there's different products like that that are good for halting it to a point, but speed is the number one thing you want to work on. So the way I like to start with my lips is I hold them, hold my lip skin between my thumb and forefinger, and I'm just going to slice down. Now I, with a sharp knife, it should cut very easily, and I'm going down real nice. Then I can get a hold of this like that. Now I can cut like so. And you just want to butterfly it open, take little strokes. Accidentally I got my knife nice and sharp. <laughs> I 
And you're going to proceed all the way around? I'll go all the way around to this. And this is the, the inside back corners of his mouth, the papillae this big. This is going to get removed eventually. But I'll go all the way to there. And it's helpful for me, uh, because this is so slippery and hard to hang on to, um, somewhere I got a little... Right behind tub. that mounting stand. Oh, tub. there's some. I got more. I got a secret got it stash. All over. Um, this is salt, and it's the salt that we're going to salt the hide with. Um, by dipping my hands in salt like this, um, it gives me great grip. My glasses. And now I can hang on much better with a little bit of salt. And the salt is only going to help with your um, splitting. What kind of salt are you using? Um, this would be, what did it say, granular livestock? Um, I think so, yeah, non-iodized. Non-iodized. Um, so white salt. salt. We, get it, uh, we get it from us. <laughs> um, elevators carry it. Feed stores carry it. Some people use um, um, a rock salt, thinking that the rock salt dissolves slower and works for a longer period. Okay, now I've got that all spread out like this. Now my salt can penetrate this really well. On an animal like a moose or a buffalo, you're going to split it, even though you split it, and Matuska said all you have to do is is split in, it's going to be perfect, and all of a sudden you get it back from the tannery and you got a slip spot around here. Even though you split it on a big animal like an elk or moose or buffalo, you may have to, before you salt, you may have to come back and, and shave some of this off. Or something else we used to do all the time is make little cross hatches in it so that your salt can get down in there. And then when you get down in this front, it's really difficult to splice between. So I sometimes will take my knife and push it ahead of me and then rock it up like this. And I'm feeling on the other side so I can feel if I get too close to the other side, the hair side. Once I get it open a little bit, I can Spread it with my fingers. And so you're just coming around the bottom lip? Bottom front. Yep. And now by doing it that way, I gave myself a little something to be able to hang on to here. Am I off target? <laughs> Kate's following you. You're good. What's your thoughts on dry preservative versus tanning on hides? I have a red fox shoulder mount. It was one of the first competition pieces I ever did. And I got a blue in Iowa and Minnesota and it's in my showroom, and it's been there for 45 years, and it was instant preserve. <laughs> um, we don't, I, I would use instant preserve myself um, on every squirrel I think I ever would do. I like them on little things like that. Um, we prefer, we prefer um, a full tan for our deer, but there are a lot of taxidermists that um, like Insta Preserve, and down south it's more prevalent, I think, than it is here. And I don't know why, other than I want to say climate works better for them or the animal or something. But for some reason, you go south of the Mason Dixon line, <laughs> it yeah. seems like Insta Preserve is very popular. And there's some very good taxidermists down there that do a lot of deer. Um, I think if I instant preserved, I would want to make sure we flesh, um, thin everything with the flushing machine really, really well. Yeah, I think, um, 
I think if you did everything exactly the same as you would with a tan cape, I think you're good. Um, I think it probably would be able to re achieve pretty decent results. I always, I always said, give me, give me a, a fleshing machine and a, um, uh, some tanning oil and instant preserve, and I think I can do a deer as good as, you know, we do yeah. through the whole tanning process. Now, I would spend the time to go. A little bit. I want to. I want to go to the very, very edge of this lip, the very edge on the bottom. And if you don't, and you salt it, it dries out, and it's mm. difficult to get that very last edge without cutting through it. So I would like to spend the time now and get to the very edge, so that that doesn't shrivel up on me. And there's a lot of little little things like that you'll discover through the mounting process of how good you did and didn't do and should have done. Okay, um, I think the lip's done all the way around. And like I said, big animal like a moose, buffalo, elk, um, I would probably put this on some kind of a beam, um, like maybe this. something to put a little support behind it. And if I have a ton of meat up here, I would like to flesh that off. What do you think about Pro Tan? Um, I have not had the experience a lot of people have had with Pro Tan, and, and it's a popular tanning agent. And I think Pro Tan kind of has the pickle in. You know mm -hmm. more about Pro Tan than I do. Um, it seems to have, if you read the ingredients on the bottle, it seems to have a little bit of everything in it. Um, a little bit of all-in-one type thing. Yeah, I think it's going to save you a step or two, um, but I, I think your hide is going to get the same basic treatment. And then if you, can you tell by looking at a mount if it's been tanned or it's stiff? Um, we just had one. Speaking of Instant Preserve, I don't think the product is the problem. I think it's the person using the product more than anything else. Um, we had a, a lady bring in a deer the other day, and it was the first deer her husband had got, and he has had us do several since then, but this one had a split down the back of probably two inches, Oof. and it had instant preserve on it, and again, it's not the product. It was whoever mounted this deer um, I think did, they didn't thin anything. Um, the skin, when they were done, or when they started sewing, they were sewing through skin this thick. All the stitches were popped. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it's more the product than anything else. Okay, the other thing I want to do on this side is we've got all this cartilage laying down here. And I want to take that cartilage and lift it off the surface of the nose so I don't get that slip spot there. So, get that nice and sharper. And I'm just holding my fingers underneath and I can feel where my knife is. Now you see that cartilage just starts lifting off there. have to check our show show manager. <laughs> yeah. I think we're busy. New England sounds fun though. It does sound really fun. I think you don't get the colors in lobsters, August. Lobsters, do you get lobsters? Maybe they could move, yeah, lobsters and colors if they move their show back a little bit. Um, here is the septum. The septum is something when we, when we mount our deer, we do one of two things. We either put an artificial septum in the mount mm -hmm. or we like to use, I don't know where the nose went, um, we like to use the artificial nose, um, which has a real translucent um, septum. But for now, I'm gonna take that septum right out. Emma's asking if we're going 
going to the NTA, and we are not doing the NTA this year. We actually have, you have Brett's Judging South Dakota this coming weekend. Like um, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tonight, tomorrow. Leaving right after this. There's also the Illinois and Ohio this weekend, um, and uh, I believe that the Ohio and South Dakota both have the Masters and Professional Award. And then next weekend is the Iowa show, which Tom's judging. And I believe the Iowa and Indiana show have the Masters and Professional Competitors Award. I believe Pennsylvania's is next weekend too. But so. after the Iowa show, then it's the World Show, and that's a biggie for us. So we'll have a big display at the World Show, and we are going to be showed out. Yeah. Um, now, on a, on a deer, it's been my experience, I guess, um, typically during the salting process, we don't have much, any problem slippage around here. Anything bigger than a deer or maybe a really, really big deer, um, I would sprinkle a little salt on this and let it work for a while and we're gonna thin down this donut of meat around the eye. Um, that is an area on an elk or a moose that you're gonna, might have a little slip spot. We might show Kate just the eye itself. It might be harder for her to see where you're. From this side? There you go. Yep. There's the now eye. Now they can see where you're working. Yeah. And there's just a big protective, I call it a donut. It's just a big old round muscle all the way around the eye. Oh my goodness. I can't talk to Craig anymore because I'm not on Facebook anymore. <laughs> and then also, Brett, your musky guy is watching from the expo. Oh, really? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but I would, I would, you don't have to make it real neat. Just get that muscle broken up so that salt can penetrate it on, yeah. on both eyes. Um, uh, salt. Good question. Though. That is a good question. And. That's Marco. And I tell you the reason is because when we put this in a pickle, salt will only add to your salt in the pickle. You know, it's, it's good in a pickle. A pickle requires salt. Um, borax tends to neutralize. We always used to neutralize the pickles with borax. So borax will neutralize your pickle. So if you used a lot of borax here, though it'll work and it'll probably help set your hair and it's a bug proofer and it's a drying agent, borax is good stuff. But to put it in a pickle, I think it's going to neutralize your acid. Yep, you're going to fight so, against that. Yep, I've seen that. Um, do you want to give them a little brief sure. idea of the ear? Yep. The ear's next, and then we're going to show you a body skin, I think, yep. if we got time. Um, shouldn't take too long. We're just going to turn the ears inside out. We like to go as near to the edge as possible. If you're going to send it to a tannery, remember they're going to, put this, they're going to tumble it. And so you may choose to stay back just a little bit. Um, from the edge, the first thing I like to do is just see what I'm working with. Um, make sure I don't have any major splits because I am going to use ear openers. Um, they work really well on a deer, not so well on an elk, but they work good on whitetail, mule deer. Um, they'll save you a ton of time, but you do want to be aware of any little splits or scars. And although I don't see a scar, I see some discolored hair on the back which makes me think this was probably an old scar. I'm going to go kind of slow as I go through that. It, it may split just fine. It may be sticky. Um, we'll see how that goes. But um, another tip that we probably covered when we caped in our caping demo is if you have this deer on the skull, um, skinning over the backside of the ear where you can pull against the skull will really help you now. And you can see We've gone all the way over, at least past the scutiform here. We're up probably two inches up the backside. So I have a lot of skin that I can work against um, when that's I a, use my ear openers. big help. It really is. And if, if you haven't gone that far, it's not a terrible chore to turn it this way and get it started with a knife. We'll do that on occasion too. Um, 
Kate, I'm moving around a lot, so you tell me if I'm. So if what I'm he's doing is he's going to. He's cutting up here now, up the back of the ear as far as he can, but because he can't turn it around too far, he's going to pretty soon stick those ear splitters up in there and then just open them. Yeah, so I'm just going to do that and kind of get that somewhat opened up for you. And then I'll go with the ear splitters. And that's the ear splitter that we like. It's kind of a reverse plier action. And uh, that will. And I think the ones we have now are a little yeah, old narrower, yeah. And they also have yeah. the tail splitter on the other side. Sure. Oh, gotcha. Oh. So now I'm just going to go. You can see as I push, I'm only that far. You can see the end of the instrument there. And I'm just going to open. And you easily. can hear it. You can kind of separate. When you hear that sound, that's good. That's a good sound, yeah. When you hear it pop, that's a bad sound. Um, so I'm just working the tip around the edge. Did you have a question, Mandy? Well, they want you to do a video on repairing holes. So we don't cut holes. <laughs> yes. Uh, names of good tanneries in the Midwest. Um, there's a lot of good oh, tanneries. We I... would forget. That's, that's hard because if we forgot someone, we'd feel terrible. <laughs> uh, and then another question was off topic, but is entering shows the best way to get critiqued on your work by experts. That's a very good way. That's a, that's very a very good way. way. A very, very good way. Do um, seminars and go to all those And what you want to do, I think, I think competition taxidermists would have a difficult time making a living doing commercial work. You know, they're because they're trying to be too detail oriented that the customer wouldn't appreciate. Um, you need to go to the shows, listen from those people in a competition environment, and see what you can take and streamline it to make a better commercial product, I think. Um, yeah, That's, that will certainly advance your, advance your skills very quickly. Um, I went all the way around. I kind of pushed, pushed the tip of the tool left and right. As I, I went slow around the edge, I really didn't feel too much. There is... There is a scar there at that dark spot where I see that it did pop through just a little bit. And I just went around that way and now I'm gonna turn it inside out. Now whenever I did. went on a hunting trip or, and they only work for deer really, um, I never had ear splitters. Like if we went caribou hunting or something like that, I would always take a tool like this or um, we have some really nice little uh, fleshing tools and turn your ear inside out with this mm -hmm. and cut back and forth like um, you're doing that. That's, that's exactly what I'm trying to show them here. And you can see right there over that dark skin, it looks like the hair didn't, the skin didn't split off of the cartilage quite as well. So there is a tiny little hole right there. And we, if we're gonna tan our deer capes ourselves, we like to get the ear split to the very edge at this point works the best. Um, yeah. because it's easier to do than coming back later and doing it. If we're sending to them to the tannery where they're going to put them in a big tumbler and tumble them with sawdust, we tend to stay back eighth to yeah. a quarter. And so to take them, like Tom said, to the edge, we'll just use a dowel like this um, and a scalpel because we've got a real nice, sharp, controllable edge, and we'll just put the dowel in and push. Um, you can split over the dowel with a little bit of pressure. Do you have your tub of salt? Here, just a little bit. Um, again, ear side, inside of the ear can be a little bit slippery. A little salt on my fingers will help me. Um, and I'm just gonna very carefully take this to the edge with my fingers and a little pressure. Little. Little, don't tear it. You'll know when you went a little too much. And all of this takes practice, how much pressure and how much pushing and what you can do with the dowel and what you have to do with the knife. Um, the, the more you practice, the more efficient you'll become. I think the first time somebody does ears, what do you think a reasonable amount of time would be, or expectation of time for their for first beginner? ears to turn? Yeah, two hours. I bet it would take all of that. This year is basically done rather until I get to the very edge in five minutes, yeah. three minutes. Um, but the first one, yeah, don't be afraid to be 
an hour or so, or two hours. Oh, and speaking of that, that's probably a good time to tell them too. Remember, um, bacteria growth is our biggest enemy right now. Heat and moisture, or temperature and moisture, are the two factors that promote vac bacteria growth. Lots of heat in your fingers. So if you're spending a whole bunch of time with this in your hands, you're adding warmth to this area. You could actually cause slippage. It wouldn't be a bad idea if you've spent five or 10 minutes in one spot to maybe go back over to the other ear or work somewhere else on the on the uh, body for a few minutes. And we would that notice cool that with down. students. We'd come and help them and they were working on the ears for a long period of time and we would just touch the ear and we'd go, wow, you know, that's very not warm. touch that ear for a while and let it cool down. Um, what I'm doing now is the base of the ear canal has a pretty significant muscle structure um, attached to it and we took that from the skull um, but this chunk of meat needs to come off so it's nice and clean. There's no, there's nothing here that we need to save. We are going to save the bottom of the inner ear, but I'm just going to go against that real quick now and go all the way around and see if I can get that cut away. I don't think I turned my phone off. I thought I did. I haven't heard Something. it. Okay, good. <laughs> it might be real quiet in my coat pocket back there. Oh. Um, well, that's what that but is. We will take all of this off all the way to the edge and uh, that ear will save the inner ear and we'll remove that whole muscle structure from the bottom. Now it's worth noting, remember we talked about putting back what we take out. Eventually we're going to have to recreate that on the mannequin. It's not a bad idea right now to look at it and just look at the size and relative shape and where the points of connection are of these muscles because someday if we ever have to put this deer back together on live, we're gonna wanna know where all those muscles connected. So right now is your very best reference. Any um, special tricks for um, those ripped ears from fighting? Um, in the splitting process, I'd just say go slow. Um, and, and be aware of the splits. I think that's the biggest thing. Check the ear over really well. And if you know you have splits, it's way easier to avoid making holes than if you were to just go in there with your ear splitters and start opening it up. And You know, we've had Cape Buffalo that have mm -hmm. rips from thorns or lions or whatever that look like your fingers. You know, they're so narrow that you can, you can split them, but very difficult to split. So this is that ear muscle, the scutiform cartilage is under here, and now you can see all so, of that is nice and clean. See, compare that to the liner that you're gonna put in. And that kind of gives you an idea of what we're after. This, this one could go just a little bit further around the edge and up here in the tip. Um, you and if you're tanning yourself, further. you can always um, yep. do that in the tannery. It's safe to go in the tannery now, and that's our goal is to make this safe to go into the tear into the pickle, uh, make it safe. We're going to salt it, draw the moisture out of it, then put it in our pickle. Yeah. And even coming back to the tannery, I would probably be pretty comfortable with this going to the tannery. Sure. We're, we're probably a quarter of an inch from the very edge, and uh, that's pretty safe um, to handle the, the tumbling and so forth from the tannery. So this would be ready, of course, when we get it back. That's the point at which we're going to have to split it to the very, very edge when it comes back. But um, I think this is pretty close now. Flushing machine and pickle making next time. Sounds good. Holly says, happy St. Patrick's Day. Oh, <laughs> happy St. Patrick's Holly, Day, everybody. You. I got green. I forgot. Oh my, I'm going to get pinched. <laughs> um, we have a giveaway. Oh. <laughs> I do somewhere. We are giving away our weedy skinning knife. This is a very good knife. Oh, those are nice, knife. yeah. Those are very nice. nice. Yeah. They got a great selection of All knives. different shapes and sizes. And it's razor sharp right out of the box. Weeby Knife Company. Oh, congratulations, AJ. So remember, to get in the drawing for next week, you're want, going to want to like and share and tag a friend in this video right here, and you'll go in the chance to win for next week. 
Um, and on our St. Patty's Day, we are doing 25 percent off can pastels today only. And the sale oh, wow. is also online only, obviously, since we're the shop phone calls are closed right now. Um, use code LUCKY22. So all your pan pastels, if you're ready to try oh. them, that 25 percent off will be So check those out. Nice. What else you got? Uh, the shows, you got the Illinois, Ohio, and South Dakota this weekend, and then next weekend is Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Iowa. We got the World Show coming up, which is a big one for us. We are super, super busy and behind, but we're working around the clock to get orders out for you, so we so appreciate you Thanks guys. for your patience. Yes. patience. It's yep. so awesome. Our customers <laughs> are amazing, and we so appreciate you. Um, we are doing a system upgrade right now, so you might tomorrow on the phone with the ladies if you're placing an order. Just bear with them. If you want to place an order online, your order will be processed faster. Otherwise, they're basically typing it online as well. But just keep that in mind right now for today, tomorrow, and probably Monday, our system upgrade is in effect. So online orders are probably the best way to do it. Otherwise, the girls are there to help you on the phone. Um, just thank you for your patience. We're about two weeks out on form orders and about five days out on normal orders, driftwood and birds. But nice. we'll catch up hopefully in a couple weeks. And next week we will introduce them to the fleshing machine, um, probably the beam maybe, yep. and uh, making a pickle for Tan and yourself. Sounds good. You're going to be in Iowa next week, I think, Ooh. aren't you? Maybe it was the week after? I think. Or, or is it the week after? Oh, we oh can, I know. Next week is... It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, to be have determined. One more question here. <laughs> sure. Uh, is it better to remove the ear cartilage before or after tanning? If you want to talk? Nope. <laughs> um, I, I would. If you have time, that yeah. ear cartilage comes off very easy right now. Comes off the easiest it will ever come off now. If it goes into the pickle, it'll come off fine. But um, if you have the time, now is a good time. Um, otherwise, if we're sending it to the tannery, we leave it on for protection because they tumble mm -hmm. it. Did okay. it? Was yep. that good? Yes. I if like I that. have time, it comes off much it more does. fun now. And we can be careful when, when we're tanning it. Mm -hmm. We know that. And we're we're not going to put it, it in any big tumblers or anything like that. All good?